Thank you so much to all of you for showing up on this beautiful North Dakota day. Uh, it really is gorgeous out. As long as the wind's not blowing, I can, I can put up with this. I don't care how cold it gets, but actually a beautiful day. Uh, I'm Larry Scogan. It's my good fortune to be the president of Bismarck State College, and I certainly want to welcome all of you here. I'm going to introduce our uh, special uh, scholar here in just a little bit, but I, a couple of things I do want to tell everybody. Um, first, we... Uh, this program is streamed online, which is really an exciting way to get the humanities out, I think, to so many people. And uh, we're really indebted to Dakota Media Access again because they let us borrow their equipment, which is very nice of them. <coughs> and then they also, um, th this is taped, and then uh, it's shown on Cable Access 12. And actually, I think uh, we get, uh, it, it, it just amazes me how many people will stop me and tell me, we were flipping through channels, we saw you, and what's his name? And then, uh, and then <laughs> that's why I've got to introduce him a little bit. No, I, I'm just kidding. No, actually, they say that quite often. But no, um, but it is very, very kind of them to run those because it really gives us a much broader uh, audience in this, uh, this humanity series, and, and we certainly appreciate that. Another thing, uh, on your way out, if you didn't pick one up on your way in, there's these bookmarks here, and it's about BSC Talk or excuse me, Book Talk at BSC 2011, and it uh, lists the three books that we will be talking about here on campus at the library uh, this coming semester. And uh, I saw Dr. Janelle Masters in here. She's back there. She's going to be uh, leading the first discussion. Have you read any of those yet, Clay? No. Okay. Um, uh, so it, we certainly would appreciate having an audience this size. Uh, it, that we really have a lot of fun at that. It's like, it's like belonging to a, a, a community book club, and so we will be doing that. Um, it's been an exciting week for North Dakota, no doubt. Uh, for those of you that follow the politics, you know, we ended up with a brand new governor and a brand new budget proposal for this coming session. And Clay and I were talking. I saw Chief Vanderwall walk in. I think Chief, Chief's back there. Chief, uh, we saw you uh, swear in another governor here today. How many governors have you sworn in? Governor Schaefer, two, four then. Four. Wow, that's amazing. So, thanks for coming, Chief. By the way, it's always a pleasure to see you here. So. Uh, it has been just a marvelous week for North Dakota uh, from a political standpoint. And, and we're going to get to talk about John Steinbeck today and, and about North Dakota and John Steinbeck, the author, and all that sort of stuff, too. So what I want to do first, because uh, we see so many new faces out here today, um, we, what? Well, you might want to talk about the schedule for the spring because you're going to make a change. No, we're not going to make a change. We're not going to make a change. No, no. Uh, the, the person that talked to us was misinformed on that. I'm sorry. We're that. okay. Yeah. We're okay. Good. Anything else you want to say? No. <laughs> I'm pretty much done. So uh, it really is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Clay Jenkinson. Clay is a Rhodes and Danforth scholar, uh, is a published author and one of the leading public humanities scholars in the United States. He hosts a nationally syndicated radio program from Bismarck, the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and works as a speaker, consultant, and facilitator. Uh, Clay directs the Dakota Institute of the Fort Mandan Foundation and serves on its board. He is chief consultant to the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University, the D distinguished scholar of the humanities at Bismarck State College, and a columnist for the Bismarck Tribune. He is also an award-winning filmmaker, researching, writing, and participating in documentary films about notable North Dakotans. In fact, he's uh, two are out, one on Art Link and a uh, second one on Bill Guy uh, was just recently released. And uh, Clay has an MA from Oxford University, England, a BA in English Literature from Vanderbilt, and a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. He was born in Minot and raised in Dickinson, so please welcome Clay Jenkinson. Can I, okay, can I just say, Larry, about um, what we're doing at the Dakota Institute? Now, we have a press. We have the Dakota Institute Press, and we're, our goal is to publish three to five books per year. And we published our first book in April. It's called River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia. And it's about Lewis and Clark on the 
other side of the Rocky Mountains. And, so, and it's already done extremely well. I mean, it's, we, our distributor is, is the University of Oklahoma Press, and they, that solves the problem because it's, it's one thing to create a press. It's a very different thing to distribute a book to Barnes and Nobles and so on around the country. And so now we've sort of solved that problem. Our second book is, the reason I mentioned it, our second book is just about to come out. It's um, a memoir by former North Dakota governor um, Bud Sinner, George Sinner. It's called Turning Points, and it'll be out by February 1st. It's, in the, it's literally in the press now. And we're very delighted by that, so I was hoping you know, people would watch for that, because then there, I'm writing a, a new version of a book I did on Meriwether Lewis. We're going to publish the poetry of a North Dakota poet, Fargo-based uh, Tim Murphy. And so three to five books a year, and the Dakota Institute Press is dedicated to looking at North Dakota, the Great Plains, the Upper Missouri, white Indian relations, spirit of place, the future of agriculture, the future of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And so we're just thrilled about this, and I hope people will sort of follow that. This is going to be, I think, a major regional, even national press that's located right here in Washburn, North Dakota. So we're that's that's thrilled. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's get to the topic of the day here, uh, and uh, let's talk about John Steinbeck. And so I know that uh, you've put together the, or uh, did you want to talk about this stuff first? No, no so you're not. doing okay. So okay, so you want well, to talk about ahead. Steinbeck? Let's go ahead and stop it. Who who was he? And let's just talk about him as a guy. Well, first of all, welcome. You know, there are some people here that haven't been here before. Yeah. We certainly welcome them. We meet all the time here. You can get the schedule, and as as you said, it's streamed on BSC Talk, and it's also on the cable access station here. So I, sometimes when I'm flipping around. You know, do you ever do this? You're surfing around and you see yourself. That is <laughs> not a yet? that is not a fun event. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, you just think. Then you watch for a few minutes and realize, man, what an idiot. You know, <laughs> I mean, don't you ever? You would not think I, that, I don't of course, think no. That, but no. I do. Let me just ask, out of curiosity, how? And this is not meant to shame anybody. How many of you have never had the opportunity to read *The Grapes of Wrath*? You see how, how few that is, Larry. I mean, yeah. the one point I want to make is that the, the Grapes of Wrath, which I think is far and away Steinbeck's greatest work, I mean, by magnitudes, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but the Grapes of Wrath is still one of the most often read classics in American literature. And if you think of the great books of American literature, Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, Moby Dick, uh, My Antonia by Willa Cather, if you, if, you, if you sort of make a long list of the greatest novels, the greatest works of American literature, the one that holds up the best and is most often read is The Grapes of Wrath. And there are a couple of reasons for that, and I'll come back to it later, but one is that it's excessively written. You know, Moby Dick is hard sledding for a lot of people, particularly when Melville gets into the endless chapters about whale culture and the history of whaling and different types of whales, subspecies, and so on. And Huckleberry Finn has its problems now, even though I think it's a greater novel than The Grapes of Wrath, but it has this fundamental problem that Twain uses the N-word hundreds of times. And even though Twain was a man of his times and, and, and he had transcended his own race bigotries, this, the fact that the N-word appears so often in that book makes it a very problematic book to use in the 21st century, and lots of people just no longer read it, which is a shame, because it's such a great novel. But, but of all of the major novels of American culture, from Faulkner to Hemingway um, and on out, I think The Grapes of Wrath is the one that has the largest readership as the 21st century begins. So that's good. Yeah, but it too has been banned. It is. I mean, I, we're sort of rushing ahead a little bit, but yeah. The Grapes of Wrath was published in 1939. The critical reception of it was mixed. I mean. Steinbeck himself never regarded himself as an author in the same way that, say, Norman Mailer regarded himself as an author. You know, the author as a celebrity. You know, today, an author's deepest dream is to be called by Oprah and appear on, on Oprah. Mm -hmm. Steinbeck would have said flatly no to that. Steinbeck's view was a very simple one. If you want to read my books, read them. If you like them, read more. But there's nothing that I, Steinbeck, could ever say to you 
that's of any interest. The book is the book, the art is the art, and the, the author is just this person who produced it. He regarded himself as fundamentally uninteresting, and he wouldn't do interviews, and when this book was about to come out, he wrote it in 100 days, so that in itself is shocking. He wrote it between May and October 26th of 1938, 100 days. I'll show you the manuscript here in a minute. 2,000 words a day. When it was finished, he told his publisher, oh, let's print 25 or 30,000 copies because he was afraid that the book wouldn't sell. And it became a phenomenal runaway bestseller and they couldn't, they literally couldn't keep up with uh, the demand for the book. But the book was very deeply criticized in a number of quarters. For example, um, Senator Boren of Oklahoma said, on the floor of the United States Senate, I say to you and to every honest, square-minded person in America uh, that the painting Steinbeck made in his book is a lie, a black, infernal creation of a twisted, distorted mind. And that's because, of course, he was writing about Okies, and Oklahoma felt that this was a bad portrait of it, its people. The book was literally banned in East St. Louis by the library board. It was banned by the Kansas City Board of Education. It was banned in several places in Pennsylvania. Um, the, associ the, the Associated Farmers of California, who were, of course, they're the enemy in the book, <laughs> so they, it's not surprising that they called it, quote, obscene sensationalism and propaganda in the ugliest form. Uh, the Oklahoma City Times on May 4th, 1939, called it a morbid, filthy worded novel, obscene, vulgar, lewd, stable language. And, but here, I've done a lot of lectures on Steinbeck around the country, and I did one in California a couple of years ago, and I discovered, Larry, amazingly, that in Kern County, which is where Bakersfield is and where Weed Patch, the government-run um, camp, is set in this book, in Kern County, California, the book was banned in the public school system until 1978. So that's how, how much negative criticism he got. So there are two fronts for the negative criticism, really. One is, well, there are really three. One is his attack on the corporate farm industry in California, which is, a, which is where you get the title Grapes of Wrath, that they've, they've done things so morally offensive that the Grapes of Wrath are being trampled out for some sort of retribution. The sec so that was one, um, one attack on it. The second is that it's a socialist book which is partly true, and we, we can come back to talk about that. And the third is that it's obscene, and it's obscene in a couple of different ways. The F word appears in it, which, which automatically makes it a difficult book for some school systems, even now. There's a lot of frank talk in the first part of the book about sexuality, and then in the end, as you know, there's the famous ending where Rosa Sharon, who's, she's just given birth to a stillborn child because of the terrible... Um, strain on her body during this odyssey that they've gone on. She gives, there's a flood in the Central Valley of California. She gives birth, the child is stillborn, and they are in a barn trying to stay away from these rising floodwaters, and they find a starving man and his son. And there's this unbelievable scene at the end which caused a huge stir in which she offers her breast to the dying man, and the, and the book closes on that scene. And when, when Paolo Covici, the publisher of Steinbeck, read the book, he loved it. But he did two things. He, he tried very, very hard to talk Steinbeck out of that last paragraph. And he couldn't accomplish it, and the, that caused the book to be, that's the most often talked paragraph in all of Steinbeck. But he also sent his assistant, Elizabeth Otis, to to deal with Steinbeck because the book has so many vulgarisms, let's call them, swear words, F words, and so on. And so she went out to uh, California to work with him, and they went over the manuscript for a couple of weeks, and as you can expect, he was absolutely grumpy and non-cooperative. <laughs> and then she finally sent these telegrams back to Covici in New York with the, you know, it says, on page three, it says, F you. And then we're changing that to damn you. 
And she sent this, it was like a 30-page telegram, and, and it was called the most obscene telegram ever sent in American history, <laughs> <laughs> because there were all these terms. Yeah. And so the book has those three raps against it, that it's a communist tract or a socialist tract, that it's, a, a, and it's an assault on corporate agriculture, or, or let's say capitalist agriculture, and that it has this, um, the sexual, um, sexual activity that goes on it, and then continuous use of words that were regarded as slang or worse at the time. Just to go on one more step on this, he, he, was, he was warned by his publishers never after this, never to go into the Central Valley of California alone, because there were death threats, and he was warned never to check into a hotel without somebody else with him because of fear that they, they would send a, an attractive woman to try to set him up in a scandal of some sort. And so he, his life was in some danger in the years following, the months and years following the publication of this book. It won the um, Pulitzer Prize for Literature in 1940, and then in 1962, uh, John Steinbeck won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, based on this book, basically. Okay. Before we get too far into that, and we've already gotten quite, why don't we go back and let's talk, just about, talk about who he is. But Steinbeck was born in 1902. He died in 1968. Um, as I said, he won the two great prizes, the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature and the Pulitzer Prize. He won a ton of other prizes, too. He basically lived his life on the far west coast and the far east coast. On the west coast, he lived in Salinas, and Monterey and Carmel and sometimes in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So in that corridor between LA and San Francisco, but his home was Salinas. And the town we most associate with him is Monterey. He, he spent some years of his life in New York City and towards the end of his life, he and his third wife Elaine lived on Long Island at a place called Bar Harbor. And so he essentially spent his life on the two coasts. He never, for any reason, lived in the interior of the country. He crossed it a few times, but he was really a coastal person in California. He's essentially a California writer. He was married three times. Now here's a caricature of him. It's a beautiful caricature. This is the statue of him. It has a beautiful sort of working class face. We should tell the story about Gene and Bill Guy here in a minute, but uh, I want to get to the, here are his three marriages. Um, he was married to Carol Henning between 1930 and 42, to Gwendolyn Conger from 1943 to 48, and his third wife, who, who survived him, Elaine Scott, 1950 to 1968. Um, each of these wives helped name one of his books. And the first wife, Carol Henning, was reading, she was typing the manuscript of The Grapes of Wrath for him. He would write in longhand with a pencil, you'll see it in a minute. She would then type it up on a manual typewriter at the end of the day. And she was reading along in this book, and she said, you know, this kind of reminds me of Julia Ward Howe's hymn, The Grapes of Wrath. And so he said, that's the title. And when they were divorced in 1942, she believed that she was entitled to a very large compensation for having given him such a magnificent title. Did she get it? No. <laughs> His second wife, Gwendolyn Conger, was a dancer. That he, he met his second wife while he was still married to his first wife. She was a dancer in L.A., and she came to resent that her career was obscured by his massive fame and celebrity. And so they were divorced in 1948. Uh, soon thereafter, he met Elaine Scott, and, and she's the, she named Travels with Charlie when he was going to go on the, the journey with his uh, camper van in 1960, uh, just, and his health was not good, and she was worried about him. And she said, you know, I don't want to go along, but maybe you should take the dog. <laughs> and so, so I mean, that changed the whole book. You, take, you just read Travels with Charlie. You take Charlie out of the book, and it's not much of a book. A book yeah. And so then, he, so he was calling her, you know, the telephone system was very primitive back then and very expensive. He called her once in a while, and he called her from the road and talked about some of the things that were going on. And she said, you know, there's a book by Robert Louis Stevenson about travels with a donkey, 
This sort of sounds a little bit like that kind of a whimsical trip, so maybe you should call it Travels with Charlie. And so these wives had a, um, I can't remember which the, what, what, what Gwendolyn's title was, but they all named books for him, and they all resented that, they, that he kind of used them up, and then, it's not that he went on, but that he used them up for his own creative energies, but they never got much out of it except a grumpy husband. You know, Steinbeck said, he said, a writer is the least interesting person in the world because a writer is somebody who goes into a room alone for six or eight hours a day. You can't go with him. He has to be alone. But when he comes out after that time, he's dazed. He's numb, he's exhausted, he's dazed, he's spent. And all he wants at that point is to be comforted by somebody who makes absolutely no demands on him. And he said, excuse my terminology, but he said, but a writer's a son of a bitch and no woman should ever stay with one because they're just not nice people, because they're really people alone in a room. And so his life is, is, is not that interesting as a life, but he wrote more than 30 books, and a couple of them, Larry, are, are American classics. Uh, back to his personal life, a couple of questions. Um, when you read Grapes of Wrath, you think that he's you know, really a, a defender of the downtrodden and all that, but he really grew up he wasn't bad off. He, he didn't grow up poor. Did he, his father? In Salinas, he grew up in a lower middle class family. But remember the time he grew up in. Yeah. This was a very difficult time in the history of the United States and California. But he did get to go to Stanford. Stanford wasn't then the kind of citadel on the hill that it is today, but he was able to go to Stanford for five years. He never took a degree. He was, he was only really poor with his first wife. And they were very close to homeless at times. But then once he published, he published 30 books, his first one was called Cup of Gold, didn't sell well, several books didn't sell well. Then he wrote Tortilla Flat in 1935 and it sold and from then on he was never poor again. Okay. So there was a period of real poverty and he had a, he worked in the lettuce fields around Salinas. He, 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 worked, he was part of some strikes, some workers strikes. You know, he, had, he paid his dues. He was a laborer in a way that I, mean no disrespect, but I'm sure you and I never have been. <laughs> have you ever he had, worked in the lettuce fields, Larry? He had, yeah. uh, he had two children. Born Which by his wife number two, Tom and John. Okay. Are they still living? Yes. Do you know what they're doing? Uh, Any idea? I mean, no. are, are they writers? No, or? no they've, they've completely, there was some estrangement there. They, they basically sided with their mother when the divorce occurred. And they, they go sometimes to, John, I know, goes sometimes to symposiums and conferences, but they're not, they're not like the children of the great one who want to keep his reputation alive. They've sort of gone in a different direction. Oh, okay. That's it. You have no more questions there? So here, his close, so you have the three wives, two children, regards himself as a kind of a loner son of a bitch. His closest friendship in his life was with a man named Ed Ricketts. Ed Ricketts is a marine biologist who lived in Monterey. And so if, if you've ever read Cannery Row, which was published in 1945, the doc, the main character in that novella shown here, is Ed Ricketts. And Ed Ricketts is important to Steinbeck for, for really two reasons. He was sort of they met in, the, in a dentist's office in 1930, and they had an 18-year friendship until Ed Ricketts died in a somewhat suspicious one-car accident in Monterey in 1948. But during that period, they went down to the, to the Baja, to the Sea of Cortez together, and they, were, they went off on many sort of junkets around California. But, but Ricketts had, had two essential influences on him. Here's another picture, a picture of Ricketts. Here are, the, here are the two things, the phalanx and non-teleological dynamics. Let me quickly explain what I mean by that. Ricketts was a marine biologist, so he would go to these, these, these literals, these, these places on the sh where the shore and the, and, the, and the ocean met, and he would you know, pull out octopuses and so on. And his view was that it's sort of a Darwinian jungle out there, that there's no morality, that the strong fish eats the weak fish, and and little fish gang up into what he calls phalanxes to destroy the alpha male or the, or the big fish. But that you can't weep for this, this is just the way of the world, that everybody's eating something and 
there's no morality of any sort about this. It's really just the survival of the fittest, and whenever humans try to moralize about these sorts of things, they're making a terrible mistake. And so he, he was constantly urging Steinbeck to pull away from his desire to moralize and to just describe these massive movements, like, for example, between 1930 and 1940, 300,000 Okies went, and those are people from Arkansas, Kansas, and Oklahoma, but in some parts of Texas, but 300,000 Okies migrated from the southern Great Plains to southern California. Ricketts would see that as just a mass human migration that was touched off by the Dust Bowl, and, and that there's nothing more to be said about it, and that some of the people who do this are going to go out into California and get rich, and some of the people are going to go out to California and die, and some are going to be poor all of their lives, and that your duty as a novelist is not to try to make sense of it. Your duty as a novelist is to describe it dispassionately and without imposing some sort of a moral framework on it. So non-teleology, tele, teleology means that things are headed towards some end. But non-teleological thinking is that things just are things. You just describe them. And you can see in The Grapes of Wrath that, this, that Steinbeck is attempting to write a non-teleological novel, which winds up being heavily moralistic at the end. Otherwise, it couldn't have had the title The Grapes of Wrath. The other one is The Phalanx, and I've sort of already described it. I'm going to read you a passage based on The Phalanx here, but that, that little creatures band together and take out the alpha male when they have to, because that's the only way that you know, the downtrodden can do this. So here's this famous passage from page 152 of The Grapes of Wrath. One man, one family driven from the land. This rusty car creaking along the highway to the west. I lost my land. A single tractor took my land. I am alone, and I am bewildered. And in the night, one family camps in a ditch, and another family pulls in, and the tents come out. The two men squat on their hams, and the women and children listen. Here is the node. You who hate change and fear revolution, keep these two squatting men apart. Make them hate fear and suspect each other. Here is the onlong of the thing you fear. This is the zygote. For here I lost my land is changed. A cell is split, and from it its splitting grows the thing you hate. We lost our land. The danger is here, for two men are not as lonely and perplexed as one. And from this first we, there grows a still more dangerous thing. I have a little food, plus I have none. If from this problem the sum is we have a little food, the thing is on its way, and the movement has direction. Only a little multiplication now, and this land, this tractor, are ours. The two men squatting in a ditch, the little fire, the side meat stewing in a single pot, the silent, stone-eyed women behind, the children listening with their souls to words their minds do not understand. The night draws down, the baby has a cold. Here, take this blanket, it's wool. It was my mother's blanket. Take it for the baby. This is the thing to bomb. This is the beginning, from I to we. And so you see, Larry, that he's talking about how maybe the workers of America, the farm workers, will rise up and overthrow these fat cat mm -hmm. um, California capitalists because they haven't been, they're no longer individual, they're forming a phalanx. And there's a ton of moralism in there. Yeah. And so his, so Doc didn't have much of an influence then. In well, he, he did because the book is this, I mean, what makes every, let me try to just sort of explain if I can, and I'm not sure I can, but what makes a great piece of literature? A great piece of literature has tensions in it. In other words, if, if I just decided to write the, the Larry Scogan story, and I was born in Hedinger, and he went off to the Air Force, and he became this, you know, distinguished this and that, as a historian publishes books. However interesting that may be to you, Larry, um, <laughs> That's not an interesting story. You know, until, we, until, we, until the book is wrestling with something, until there is this, there's, some, there's some problem that can't get resolved, there's tension, the writer is wrestling, the writer doesn't quite know how, what to do with it. And, and this book is, the greatness of this book is that Steinbeck, it's a perfect storm. Steinbeck is writing about one of the great moments in American history, that when the Dust Bowl occurred on top of the Great Depression, and it's a North Dakota story, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people left North Dakota. More people left North Dakota between 1930 and 1940 than any other decade in our history. 
And we were on our way to being depopulated during the 1930s. And then again in the 1980s. Now things are different. But one reason why The Grapes of Wrath is such a great novel is that it gets at one of the great stories that these people were displaced from the land and they ventured along Route 66 in other ways and wound up on the West Coast. And instead of California being the promised land, it turned out for most people, for a while at least, to be a very, very problematic place. And so that, that's a great story, and Steinbeck just happened to be a writer at the top of his form who witnessed this happen, who had a sympathy for these Okies, for these poor, displaced North Dakotans, essentially. And he, would, he brought his best energies as a writer to this unbelievable story. At the same time, he's wrestling with this Ed Ricketts stuff. Is this just a story to be described, or is this, a, is this one of the great shames of American history? And that, if he had decided either way, simply, this, this book would be less great. The greatness of it comes from the writer every day when he gets down into that room with his pencil trying to figure out what, what, what is this about and how do I resolve these, these things. And so if you look at Hamlet or King Lear or Paradise Lost or My Antonia, there's another classic example of it. The greatness of it is that there are certain unresolved things in it that, that never quite get resolved for the writer or the reader. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, the Larry Scogan story, I'm sure, has some of that, but you've never told Not me much. so. Not yeah. much. Uh, no. Here are his great okay. works. I mean, yeah, he, he wrote 30, but here are the ones that made the difference. Tortilla Flats, 1935. Of Mice and Men, 1937. That, almost everybody, I mean, almost everybody has seen Of Mice and Men in a play or um, in the film with Lon Chaney. Uh, that's the book that made him wealthy. It's a very short book. Um, I'll come back to it. Grapes of Wrath, 1939. Sea of Cortez, that was with Ed Ricketts. They went down, and it's really nonfiction. Cannery Row is about Ed Ricketts, and it's about the influence of this great mentor. East of Eden. By 1950, Steinbeck was widely regarded as uh, a has-been. You know, he, he had that thing that, so, that happens to so many people. He peaked in 1939. He wrote one of the world's great books. And how do you then, how do you, what, do you, what comes next after you write one of the world's great books? Norman Mailer wrote The Naked and the Dead as a young man and he never, in the course of a long and really serious career as a writer, he never produced anything that was regarded as as great as The Naked and the Dead and, and it destroyed him. Ken Burns to a much less degree did the Civil War and the, the world watched it with rapt attention and everything else he does is a little less and it's very hard on an artist to have peaked early and so he, he wrote this book, won the Nobel Prize, became a celebrity, didn't like it. He, he believed that when a writer becomes a celebrity it dries up her or his genius and so he didn't write anything of great power after that and so in 1950 he decided that he had to prove the world wrong and write one more really great book. And that's always, a, on the whole, a bad idea for a writer because they strain then. They're straining. And so he produced East of Eden. Some of you have probably read it. It is a great book, but it's not in the magnitude of The Grapes of Wrath. When, a few years ago, I read all, all of Steinbeck. Why, I don't know. Because there's a lot of Steinbeck. And I decided to save Grapes of Wrath till last, so I read Cannery Row. I'd never read it before. I read Tortilla Flat. I read The Pastures of Heaven. I read everything. I read all of Steinbeck, Travels with Charlie, and I saved Grapes of Wrath thinking if I don't get to it, I've already read it four or five times. But then I read it, and it immediately blew me away, Larry, and I thought this is magnitudes more interesting than everything else that he wrote in the whole course of his life. So in 52, he publishes this massive book, East of Eden, there's a passage I want to quote from it, but it, it didn't quite have that effect. Then in 1960, he felt that he had lost, not only lost his genius, but he had lost touch with the, the people, with the, the great mass of the American people that had been the source of his success. And so he decided to go on a loopy auto tour across the country. And that's when he bought the pickup with the camper van and took the dog and came through North Dakota and, and that is a minor little book and you've just read it, I'll be interested in your take on it, but he
he would have regarded that as a throwaway piece. It's arguably his second most read book, and that probably would really upset him. But he, it's a very interesting book, as you know, and that was, that was sort of the last thing he did. Then he wins, he wins the Nobel Prize, and I'll just say this much more about this because it tells you who he was. He wins the Nobel Prize, which, believe me, you know, if the Nobel Committee calls you and says you've won the Nobel Prize, that's like the greatest thing that could ever happen to a, a creative person or a physicist or an economist. It just doesn't get any better than that ever. And so his, his publisher, um, Pablo Covici, insisted, said, you have to do a news conference on this one. And so the next day in New York City, I mean, first of all, let me say that the Steinbecks, Elaine and, and John, were, found out that he'd won the Nobel Prize on television. They were watching the Cuban Missile Crisis unfold on their television on Long Island, and they came to the news and they said, and today the Nobel Prize Committee awarded John Steinbeck of America the Nobel Prize. He had, he had not heard about it till that moment. So the next day he has to have this news conference, and pa uh, Pablo Covici forces him to do it, and they, there are 20 or so reporters in this room, and Steinbeck actually brought a fifth of brandy with him because he just hated this sort of thing. And the first question, this guy raises his hand, he's from the Associated Press, and he says, Mr. Steinbeck, do you think you deserve that, this prize? And Steinbeck looked at him with his deep, deep glare. And he said, no. And he got up and left. <laughs> End of conference. <laughs> because, A, he didn't think that he had done anything really since the Grapes of Wrath that had really rung the bell, and B, he couldn't stand this little creep <laughs> asking that question. He's just won the Nobel Prize for Literature and some complete, I would almost use the term from the Grapes of Wrath, but, <laughs> but some, some pathetic little person is challenging his right to win the greatest literary prize on earth. Mm -hmm. So this is his output, basically. Well, it'd be odd for somebody to get asked that question and say, absolutely, I deserve the Nobel Prize. Well, almost anybody That's would today. No, I don't think so. Oh, come on. Okay. If Cormac McCarthy won the Nobel Prize and they said, did you deserve it? He'd say, what, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great picture of him at about the time of the Nobel Prize. This is a picture of the travels with Charlie Era. I love that photograph. This is the house he grew up in in Salinas. I've been there. It's a museum. Uh, okay. I've seen that picture before. And you just said he was lower middle class. Yeah. That's a pretty nice house. Okay, Larry. I have a picture of your house here. <laughs> I mean, what's your point? That he didn't, he's not authentic because he, he, he grew no, up no. middle class? No, no. He just didn't grow up poor. You have never known poverty that Steinbeck and his first wife knew. Oh, no. I, I'm, I'm you, have, you have been living on the lap of American success. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What did, no, he would say. What did I do to deserve this? No, he would. I mean, literally, he would say this. He would say to you, "You couldn't understand the migrants. I mean, you wouldn't go out to the camps. You'd drive by. You'd be like George Bush, flying over and saying you're doing." No, no, that's yeah. not getting nasty. No, but it's not okay. nasty. But I'm just saying, you and I don't have any basis for this. We don't. We have never. We weren't part of. The, we were. Ne we've never been part of anything that deeply authentic in our well, lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but yeah. That, that, just a minute. Go back to that house. Okay. Here we go. That, I, I agree with you. If he went out there and he's, he's working the lettuce fields and he's with the migrants and he's living in their camps, but he is doing that artificially. He's putting himself in that. My point was in talking about his childhood is he grew up in a house that looks like that. That's not a migrant camp. No. Right? No. So, there, so he, he, he was putting himself in those positions. He was not forced in those positions. I know... His first wife, they, they didn't have a lot of money. In fact, I think I read that his father $25 gave him an allowance, a month, yeah. $25 a month so that they could get by. Gave him a house and an allowance. A cottage, right. Oh, okay. Right, okay, go on. You know, Larry. <laughs> I just don't think that's, a, that's growing up in poverty. Fair enough. Okay. I'm, fair enough. I, I'm not going to argue this with you because I can see that you've made up your mind. I should, <laughs> I should have left this out. Because <laughs> it makes my point. Stein, but here's what's really interesting. <laughs> I'm going to take Larry to the lettuce field. <laughs> and we'll see okay. how you hold up. Okay, let's go. Uh, he believed that there are only a handful of plots. 
you know, the, when I, remember you, if, you, if you're old enough, there used to be all these talks about there are seven basic plots or there are 20 basic plots, but Steinbeck was a very simple uh, writer, and that's one reason why I said this book holds up so well. It is a simple sort of book. It can be read by an eighth grader. It can be read by a sophomore in high school or a sophomore in college. It's not one of those books like Faulkner's, um, let's just say, um, The Bear, where you have to bring an awful lot of yourself or Light in August, which is a very beautiful, one of the great books, but it takes an enormous amount of discipline to read a book like that. Not true here. So he believed there are these seven plots. These are not his. Here's another version of it, 20 basic plots, but you know, the quest, the adventure, the rescue, the escape, that sort of thing. And, but Steinbeck had a slightly different take on it, so I've taken this picture from my own library. These are the books that he thought were the source books for almost every story that could be told now or any time. So on the bottom you have Mallory, that's the, the King Arthur cycle. Uh, then you have Chaucer, he loved tales of that sort. Uh, the Bible, A uh, Thousand and One Arabian Nights, uh, The Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer and Shakespeare. He regarded that as sort of, if you got those and had a library of only those things and mastered it, you would know, you would have the basis for any story you ever wanted to tell. And just to look at his own writing for a minute, Grapes of Wrath is basically a version of two books, the Odyssey and Exodus, the, the, the Exodus story from the Old Testament. Uh, the uh, East of Eden is Cain and Abel. You know, there are, actually, there are three sets of Cain and Abel stories in East of Eden, but he was trying to work out siblings. Uh, Mal, the Mallory stories, you know, the Lancelot story, Arthur is married to Guinevere, Lancelot is his greatest knight by far, but Lancelot is secretly having a romance with Arthur's wife, Guinevere. The adultery, the, the, the confusion between the nobility of Lancelot and, and the baseness of his behavior. He went on and on and on about this sort of question. And so these are the great archetypes, the Bible, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Arthurian cycle, Don Quixote, Shakespeare. And just look at, here are several of them, the Cain and Abel story, Think of, the, think of the stories from the Bible alone, Larry. Um, Noah and his community and Noah and his children. Adam and Eve. You know, the first, and this is the way Steinbeck would see it, the first relationship in the history of the world was troubled. You know, Eve comes back and says, here, I'll eat this apple. Adam doesn't want to. He eventually does it because she forces him to. That brings down the world. Um, the first relationship between a man and a woman in the history of the world has this kind of strife at its center and the fall that comes from it. Cain and Abel, Noah, Joseph and his brothers. If you take the New Testament, Peter and Paul, they're paradigmatic figures. Or Mary and Martha, you know, Mary is sitting at the feet of the Lord. Martha's doing all the work in the kitchen. Martha comes out and complains to Jesus. Why should Mary just sit here at your feet when I'm doing all the prep? And then Jesus rebukes Martha and says, no, Mary's doing the right thing. Or, or take the prodigal son. I mean, the prodigal son is one of the most meaningful of all biblical stories. So these parabolic, archetypical stories that come out of Chaucer, the Bible, Homer, etc. those are the, he regarded that as the meat of all literature. And his books are heavily dependent on this. Tortilla Flat is essentially his own working out of the Arthurian cycle amongst the bums of the hills above Carmel during his time. Why do you have nothing next to Travels with Charlie? Travels with Charlie goes under the Odyssey, oh, but it okay. also, Travels okay. with Charlie also has some Arthurian elements, as you know. There, he plays some little parodies of the Arthurian quest in Travels with Charlie. And Travels with Charlie is also Don Quixote. You know, he, he Steinbeck is... He names his truck. Is, he, Steinbeck, is, is, is Quixote, and Charlie is uh, Sancho Panza, and the, the truck is Rosinante. He named it Rosinante after the horse of, of um, Don Quixote. So he was constantly playing this game. Now, some literary critics regard this as one of his faults, that he was so simplistic in the way that he took these basic plots. So let's go to Travels of Charlie. You just read it. What did you, you think? Bet. Well, my turn, huh? Yeah. I actually enjoyed it uh, tremendously. I, uh, it, it's funny, it's uh, insightful, but I do, we, we were talking before we started the program here about why it's called a nonfiction. And 
I think there's so many elements of fiction in it, and so uh, we need to talk about this because there was recent letter to the editor. I think you want to address that and talk about it. As I said, it was it was uh, written in. The story occurred in 1960. The book was published in 1962, and recently I wrote a column about it in the Bismarck Tribune because a woman from the Washington Post followed the story, sort of, and I thought there was talk about authenticity. I thought that was a deeply inauthentic following. She had a rental car, her mother, and a GPS unit. I mean, any one of those wrecks this story. And then she flew back from Fargo. She didn't go on the 14,000 mile trip. She, flew, she drove from Washington, D.C. in a rental car with a navigator to Fargo, North Dakota, and then quit. And then she writes this big story in the Washington Post about how she has followed Steinbeck. Well, she went about 1,600 miles. He went 14,000. So then, anyway, I wrote that about this, what I, and I think that's very condescending about North Dakota when they always wind up here and find us quaint. And so here's his truck that he used. This was, this was brand new technology in the age of Steinbeck, the camper truck. You can see it in, at the museum in, in Salinas, California. This is the interior of it. These aren't very good pictures, but here's a better one. of the. That's what it looked like. Some of you can remember having campers like this. Some of us still do. Um, this is the journey. He starts in uh, New York, he goes up to the top of Maine, and he comes down along the Great Lakes and to Chicago where he meets his wife at a hotel for a couple of days, and then he goes to Minneapolis and up to Detroit Lakes. You see the map's not very accurate when they get to the Great Plains. Um, he ups, up to Detroit Lakes and then he crosses North Dakota on October 12th and 13th of 1960, and then he goes into Montana, dips down to Yellowstone, up to uh, Tacoma, Washington, then down the Highway 1, which is one of the world's most beautiful highways, to San Francisco and Monterey. He found out when he went to Monterey that, <laughs> um, you know, if you've ever been to Monterey today, some of you have, it's a tourist trap, and they have Steinbeck burgers and Steinbeck um, hotels and so on. When he went there in 1960, he was not well liked because he had written Cannery Row and Tortilla Flats and had, they, had, they had regarded this as an unflattering portrait. And so he was regarded as kind of an enemy. Today he's regarded as a hero, just as in Sauk Center, Minnesota. Uh, Sinclair Lewis Sinclair. is today regarded as a hero, but 35 or 40 years ago he was regarded as public enemy number one. So then he goes across to Texas has Thanksgiving with his wife who flies out to Texas. Then he goes down to New Orleans where I think one of the most interesting mm -hmm. scenes in the whole story occurs. Now he's tired. When, what happened, in, and maybe you can talk about this, Larry, but when he got to New Orleans, he saw a terrible race tension that was a result of the integration of the schools in the Deep South. And it so upset him that he kind of then just hastened home. But that wasn't that an interesting chapter? It was, and I'd not heard that story that, uh, that I mean, it's not surprising, but in New Orleans where the cheerleaders, I think they were, they were called. called. These women, white women were white called the women, cheerleaders. They would line up in front of a school that had, they had forced uh, desegregation. And they would line up outside, and, and as he talks about it, wait for this one little black girl to get out of the car. This fragile and little fragile teeny little black girl, girl. Uh, surrounded by all these U.S. marshals. And but they really saved their venom for a white family, a father who was taking his white son to school, and then the crowd, the, these white women, would start um, unprintable, I suspect. Um, Attacks screaming on, and attacks. But their anger was for the white people that were allowing were themselves allowing to, to be happen. integrated. Yeah. And then he talks, uh, I thought it was interesting, the guy he picks up and he's going to drive up the road ends up stopping and kicking him out of the, the pickup because they find he's out that yeah. he's such a bigot and uh, would never allow his children to go to school with, uh, with, uh, with a black. And it's, it's, it's quite, a really dark quite ending moving. to this journey. It, it, and that ends the journey. Because his journey is a journey into the heart of America to reconnect with the common people and with the language of the people and with the <laughs> land and so on. And so he goes on this 14,000 mile odyssey around the country alone with his dog. And he has sort of reconnected in some interesting ways. And then he gets to New Orleans where he discovers the, the flashpoint of American race tensions of, of 1960. This is just before the election of John Kennedy. And he was so appalled 
and disgusted and sickened by these cheerleaders who were, they were these overweight white women standing <laughs> as a group and just when the, when the white families that were willing to allow their children to go to school with this black girl, this lone black girl, when they would get out of the car, they would say hateful things that he had never heard in his life before to those white Southerners who were complying with the law and allowing their children to go to school with a Negro. And then he just, that was it. He just, that was the end of the journey for him. And he, of course, he still had to get all the way back home. He didn't like the woman from the Washington Post. He didn't fly back from New Orleans. <laughs> He actually went back all the way, but so then he writes this book, and and so that's the story: fourteen thousand mile auto trip, and this guy who wrote in the, in the Bismarck. There's there's Charlie, by the way. It's a beautiful French poodle. Major character in the book. There he is. This is a, a drawing, but there he is on a hilltop. You see the the camper in the background. Here he is again with Charlie. He's an old man now, and his health is no good. Here's Larry as Charlie. Oh, I, I thought, the reason I show that, Larry, is because yeah, this, this book belongs to a genre of road stories, On the Road with, by Jack Kerouac, and Piercing Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and William Leesteet Moon's Blue Highways. And I, when I was a boy living in Dickinson, my father got a call one day, and someone said, Erskine Caldwell is in town. Erskine Caldwell, who had written Tobacco Roads. And Erskine Caldwell was making one of these journeys, and my dad had a chance to go meet him. But this is a very well-worn genre of the road story that, that uh, Steinbeck was in. He'd already written a classic of it with the Grapes of Wrath, and I just thought people should see you as a road warrior. Thank you, Clay. Do you like that? Yeah, isn't that nice? You've got the, what do you call that thing? Yeah. yeah. And this oh is like, goodness. this is what Tom Jode says in The Grapes of Wrath. You remember at the end, the mm -hmm. great climax scenes? He says, whenever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Whenever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. You know, that's you. Thank you. But then I said, oh. helping the cop. You know? <laughs> Move on. You're having too much fun. Yeah, you should have been nicer about that house. <laughs> I saved that because I, I knew you'd do knew you, that. Okay, all right. So here's this guy writing in the Bismarck Tribune after I wrote that column about the fraudulent Washington Post writer who flew back from Fargo. Here's what he says. As I have found out in the last six months, he's doing some research on the travels with Charlie. Steinbeck rarely camped out. He slept for at least 40 of his 75 days on the road with his wife in the best motels, resorts, and hotels in America. That's flat out not true. At his family cottage in Pacific Grove, yes. And a fancy Texas ranch, yes, he had Thanksgiving there. But, he, but Larry, he never, you just read it, he never pretends that he's out there camping. I mean, he says, I met my wife in a hotel. And this guy makes it seem like if he didn't stay in the camper every night of the 75 nights, that then he's not authentic. But Steinbeck never says that. Um, he invented most of the characters, not true, including that itinerant actor in Alice, North Dakota, unless you North Dakotans had nine-day weeks in 1960. He also fibbed about camping overnight in Alice and in the Badlands. That's a very mean-spirited attack on Steinbeck because, A, he never pretended that he was roughing it. A camper then was a, was a motel on wheels. It was a luxurious form of traveling the country. He freely says he met his wife here and there. Um, the book is all about that. Uh, he did spend the time that he spent in North Dakota, and the, the scene with the itinerant actor is one of the great scenes in Travels with Charlie. He claims he made it up. I don't see, there's no basis for believing that, I don't think. So I don't, I don't quite understand, but he's writing a book about it, so we'll, I guess we'll find out. We're gonna find out. Do you have more on him or no, not? No, that's it. Okay, but, well then, I, I got a question. Does it really matter? What, if he camped out? Well, no, whether or not uh, that uh, itinerant actor is met in Ellis, or if it is a fabrication, or maybe a compilation of different people that he met, does that really matter? Well, the question is, I mean, your question, not his question, but right. your question is, isn't this a, this, this is essentially a form of imaginative art. It's fiction. There's a lot of fiction, a lot in, of it. fiction in it. Inevitably, he's having dialogues with a dog. And so you're saying, Duh, I mean, it's, it's, it isn't not, it's not yeah. reporting in the, in, the, in the strictest sense of the yeah. term. You know, one of the things he says right off the front, he says that uh, I'm terrible at taking notes, I, and if I do take notes, I lose them. And so I have to, I think, mule it over, I think is the term he uses. Whatever I'm going to write about, I have to mule it over. 
And uh, so after some time, then he puts down his thoughts about these trips, and yet he has these wonderful conversations, very long conversations that he met with people on the road. And so my question is about this, you know, you put quotation marks around something that you're quoting, and he has this long, long dialogue with people that by his own admission, he didn't even keep notes on. So obviously, these are, I don't want to say fabricated, but these are, as he remembers them, kind of conversations. And, and so I guess I just wonder if this really matters, if he met that actor, or is it the message that's in there? I think it's a marvelous story he's telling about America and he's trying to reconnect with America. And he has these great, we would call them sidebar conversations with these people. The, this guy, the, the guy that was gonna run him off the land and then he invited him in and they had whiskey and coffee and then he showed him a better place to park. And, and, uh, and the, the guy from St. Louis that he has this long conversation about what's going on in New Orleans. Uh, does it really matter that they, existed as they're told in the story because obviously the conversations are reconstructed from his memory so I guess I'm saying I, I don't understand why this is called a non-fiction much of it is fiction a whole chapter of a conversation with Charlie for example obviously that didn't happen well my mother talks with her dog I mean people talk yeah, does the dog talk back uh, yes <laughs> yes I mean you're the last, I won't even out you on this, but, okay, thank you. but my mother, who is a very rational human being, talks with her dog all the time. It's a schnauzer, and then she'll say, I'll say, well, I'll be there watching this, and I'll <laughs> say, well, how does the dog think? And then she'll say, well, the dog would like me to take it to the park, and she, she has dialogues with the dog. But, but, so I think you're being a little literalist here, but if you had had a, if you'd had a Steinbeck cam on the corner of that van, of that camper, and it had recorded everything from the day he left Sag Harbor till the day he returned. I think it's fair to say, Larry, that there would be a lot of deviation from the strictest reporting truth. Right. That's your point. That's my point. That, that so I is, don't know that this matters. This he's is touching up the story the way everyone does. You can't, right. every writer, the, if Aristotle says literature is better than history, in certain ways because in literature you can shape the material, in history you have to hew to what actually happened. And so if, if this had been a Steinbeck cam and, and you had written, you'd been then looking at it and had written the story, you would have written a very different story. He's, he's written a book about a travel through America of 14,000 miles, most of it you never hear one word about. Luckily he lingered in North Dakota, we'll come back to that, but he is clearly shaping this material for an effect and he's recreating conversations that he probably barely remembers, and he's putting words in people's mouth and touching up his words and so on, right? And that's what you're saying. That's so all how I'm can, saying. But I mean, I don't think that necessarily takes this out of the realm of nonfiction, but it means that you need to come into it with this idea that it's gonna be, it's an imaginative work. Mm -hmm. But the guy, here's the thing about the guy. He comes into North Dakota and he goes to Fargo, and he says, Remember, he says, I've always wanted to see this mythological place, Fargo, that's so big and, you know, Wells Fargo and the, the pioneer period and the West and that I've, all my life I've wanted to see it. And then he says, the worst thing you could ever do if you've had that feeling about Fargo is actually see it because it turns out to just be a Midwestern town of 40,000 people and there's nothing very interesting about it. So he comes to Fargo and, it, and he says, Fargo, on the maps, I should have brought a map, but he says on the maps of America, Fargo is always in the fold. So if the map is, you know, if this is the west coast and this is the east coast, Fargo is always in this gutter. And he said that's one reason that he wanted to see it, because it was the place where the fold in the American map was. But then he comes to Bismarck, he says, no, that's where the fold really should be. This famous passage on the Missouri River we'll come back to. But taking him back, he starts the day in Detroit Lakes, he goes to Fargo, Fargo disappoints him. So then he goes out on Old Highway 10 west of Fargo and he gets to the Maple River. And the Maple River, as you know, crosses that road twice. And there used to be, some of you are old enough to remember this, there used to be on Old Highway 10 a little, not a rest area, but a turnoff, or a little kind of dirt parking area beneath some trees overlooking the Maple River right there on Old Highway 10 and he pulls off there to do some laundry and he, he turns the dog loose and the dog goes and finds another camper guy down the, at the other end of this little place and then Steinbeck gets a conversation going with him. 
And the guy is not a, really an itinerant actor. What he is is an elocutionist. And I remember these from my childhood. You probably do, too. There used to be itinerant elocutionists who would go from school to school, and they wouldn't really have a speaking schedule. They'd just kind of turn up and talk to the principal or the superintendent, and then they would get a speaking gig. And they'd, the auditorium would be filled, and then they would do a, a few passages from Shakespeare, and they would do... William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold or Lincoln's Second Inaugural. That, this was a very common thing at the heart of the 20th century. And so he runs into one of these guys. And, and the funny part of this, and I really do urge everybody to read Travels with Charlie, the funny part of this encounter is they're in this other guy's camper, and Steinbeck is traveling incognito. He's not telling anybody that he's the great Steinbeck. And so this guy doesn't know him from Adam. And, the, and Steinbeck begins to, they start to pour a little whiskey in their coffee. And Steinbeck says to him, well, what do you do? And he, the guy explains all this. And then the guy says, you know, you look like somebody who might have some theatrical background. Have you ever done any theater? Now, remember, he's asking this of the man who wrote Of Mice and Men, which became one of the most successful Broadway productions in American history. And so here's this guy who doesn't know he's talking to Steinbeck. And he says, you ever dabbled in the theater? And Steinbeck says, yeah, a little. And the guy says, well, how'd you do? And then Steinbeck says, mostly flops. <laughs> you know, that's, it's, it's a fun thing that he's doing. And I've always wondered what that itinerant actor must have thought if he ever bought the book and realized, oh my gosh, I was with Steinbeck <laughs> asking him if he had any success. You know, it's a cool, it's a cool yep. moment. So then he's... So then he spends the night there, and the next day he crosses North Dakota, and he has that famous scene at Bismarck, and then he goes to the Badlands of western North Dakota, which he didn't much like. Remember that passage? Yeah. Um, are you going to go back to the Bismarck one, yeah, or we can, can we right linger now. that Here for a while? Here it is. This is the okay. famous passage. I've, we've, we've actually quoted it on this stage before, but um, this is the famous passage. Someone must have told me about the Missouri River at Bismarck, North Dakota, or I must have read about it. In either case, I hadn't paid attention. I came on it in amazement. Here is where the map should fold. Here is the boundary between east and west. On the Bismarck side, it is eastern landscape, eastern grass, with the look and smell of eastern America. Across the Missouri on the Mandan side, it is pure west, with brown grass and water scorings and small outcrops. The two sides of the river might well be a thousand miles apart. That's maybe the most famous passage in Travels with Charlie. And it's not, it's not quite true. We who live here know that it's not as, quite as stark as that. But if you're from somewhere else and you've been driving along from Fargo to Valley City and Valley City to Jamestown and Jamestown to Driscoll and Sterling and, and then you suddenly cross into the other side where the buttes are and the short grass, it, could, it would have that effect. I'm going to guess that when he came through, does anybody, was the interstate done yet? No. This is okay. Old Highway 10. So he would have crossed the Singing Bridge. He, he crossed the old memorial bridge that had the yeah. metal lattice work at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. I just did that, by the way. I took my daughter back to Kansas, and we drove down to around Norfolk, Nebraska, and there is a toll bridge there that has the same iron grate. It was very scary to cross that. <laughs> You know, you just you know why they finally paved that thing because you look down and there's the Missouri River and the bridge is swaying and yeah, yeah. but it was okay. We're going to the Badlands. So the Badlands. Then he goes okay. to the Badlands. We'll come back to what he did at Maple River in a moment. But he got to the Badlands and he didn't like them very much. He had a couple of encounters there. One, two really funny encounters. But here's what he said about the Badlands of North Dakota. So remember then, this is before the Medora phenomenon, before Harold Schaefer discovered Medora and turned it into you know, what it became. It was like Marmoth then. It was just a little broken down ghost town. It was really dirt streets, uh, nothing there really. And so, and there was, the park was there, but the park was much different then. And the entrance station was at another place and it was very low, low rent kind of thing. Here's what he says of the Badlands. They deserve the name. They are like the work of an evil child, such a place the fallen angels might have built as a spite to heaven, dry and sharp, desolate and dangerous, and for me filled with foreboding. 
A sense comes from it that it does not like or welcome humans. So he was one of those people not enchanted by the North Dakota Badlands. He got a little better at sunset. Doesn't he call it the good lands, though, by the time he leaves? Yeah, it? because at sunset, like everybody else, he sees that, you know, by day it's all bleached out, but then at sunset it becomes rosy and more intimate, and he kind of forgave it. But he had two really interesting encounters in the Badlands that I just love. He stopped, he went off the main road, off um, Old Highway 10, and got onto some sort of a dirt road, and he met a rancher. The rancher was fixing fence, remember this? And he stops to ask for directions or something, and he said he talked to the rancher for 30 minutes and got less than one sentence out of the, the rancher. This guy was just like Marlboro Man, and not too sure about the guy in the pickup. And, and in half an hour, he got one little broken sentence out of this guy. And then he went on another side road, and he found one of those clapboard Badlands houses, two stories high, and 1,000 square feet. And he knocked on the door to get some water or something, and a woman answered. And she invited him in and gave him water. And she was from Carolina, I think not from here. And Steinbeck said, she would have talked till the end of time. <laughs> so he has these like two paradigmatic moments in the Badlands, the, the Marlboro man who has nothing to say, and then the lonely woman who was brought here in marriage and wishes she were back in Charleston. That was cool. And then he goes into Montana and he disappoints North Dakota because he says, oh, Montana is a thousand times more interesting than anything else I've seen. Yeah, he's got this great love affair with Montana. Not North Dakota. Not North Dakota. But see, here's what's so important about the North Dakota episode in this, Larry. When he stops at the Maple River, and this is sort of good news and bad news for us. The bad news is he regards North Dakota as nowhere land. Uninteresting, just bland. And because of that, he then at the Maple River stop decides this is a good time between interesting things for me to step back and evaluate my trip so far. And so the longest single chapter in Travels with Charlie is written about North Dakota, but it's not really about North Dakota. It's about when you're in nowhere land, how you think about the other themes of your trip. Mm -hmm. And so he then talks about some, some things that continue to happen, the homogenization of American culture, how the, the interstates have destroyed local communities and local flavor, that the food is all industrial food and it's bland and there's a sameness to the country and the speech of the country used to be so much more interesting and regional and colorful and now it's all homogenizing because of the media and so on. And so he's sort of saying the industrialization of America has made it a kind of a less interesting place. But he accepts that industrialization. He says this is it. This is where we're at and this is where we're going to Nothing to be done to be. about it. Nothing right? to be done about it. But, but, but he's saying it is what it is. That's why it's nonfiction. I mean, he's, he's, he's admitting what he sees, but, and some of it's troubling that as the country becomes more comfortable, um, as people's lives are actually better, as, the, as communication systems are better, as people have media, as people are less lonely, as people have standardized food and access to all of the fruits of life, which that miracle began around 1940 and is continuing and, and just marching as we enter the 21st century, he says it's, it's great because people's lives are better. But you lose something, too. You lose that regional speech and the local color and the characters and the, the quaintness and the ma and pa -ness of America. Do you think he was right about that? He talks about, the, I think the word he uses, localness, that, that we're losing our localness. He, he blames the radio and, and now the television at that time of destroying the localness. Do you think that's true? Not entirely, but yes, largely. What do you think? I'm guessing you take the other point of view. Well, I think we, we have so many regional differences yet, and, and even in our speech. Uh, one of the things he says is that the first time, I mean, I can't believe the guy was in Fargo. He says, the first time I saw, uh, heard an accent is when I got to Montana. And I don't know about you, or I know when I travel, as soon as I open my mouth and start talking, they'll say, where are you from? Because we do have, we do have, have well, you it. have Def it. You have it. Oh, well, thank you. You've got to. I mean, you sound like a guy from Hedinger, really. <laughs> no, you do. You, I mean, you're not, a, you're not a Chicagoan and you're not a Southerner. You are definitely a North Dakotan okay. in your speech. And I think I'm that's proud great, of Larry. It. Yeah. But he is saying that because of radio and television, we've lost that local. There's been an evening out. 
Yeah. Don't, you don't think that's true? Well, I, I think it's true that you know, we, we all dress the same, kind of, although I do think we still have dialects, and I think we have, you know, I mean, nephla soup, come on. You know, you can't get anywhere else but around here, you know? So I think we still, I think we've maintained a lot of that. And, and I think in 1960, when he saw it, he expected this all to be gone and sort of melt toast across the country, and I don't think that happened. Well, I'll, but, we're sort of moving away from Steinbeck, but I guess it's based well, on what he's reflecting yeah, on yeah. in the country. I disagree with you in some part. I mean, there's de definitely that, I mean, in, in Dickinson you can buy borscht, and here you can buy nephla, and in North Dakota you can get a Fleischkiekla, and we definitely do have some accent here, and there is sort of a more of a, I mean, you can't, we did this thing up in, um, in Velva when we had this, the Severide Symposium, and Iris there had this, they did a, a group, a smorgasbord for us, and there were like 40 different types of bars. I mean, think of that. You know, I had never in North Dakota. It, I lived in California for five years and never had a bar. <laughs> you know, we're we are like the world's experts at hot dishes and bars, mm -hmm. and that there's some of that. There's some of that culture left, and I love that part of it. But I've been actually writing a long essay about this that I'm eager for you to look at, called "The Changing Face of North Dakota," and it'll be about a 50-page essay about what is happening to North Dakota. You know, when I was growing up, for example, just to give you one. When we would call my grandmother in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, she would, the call, the long distance call bothered her, and she would limit it. There was no way you could have a 20 minute conversation with her. And even when long distance became cheap, we would call her and she would say, what's wrong? But she, now think of a young person today, there's no sense of that today, the, the communication systems are, are dramatically different, and I think that it's not just technology that these things influence the way we see and the way we are. And that's been true of almost everything. We're more, we're more mobile, we have more discretionary income, we're better wired to the rest of the world. We can order any book we want from Amazon.com, order anything we want. You can get, remember, if you're old enough, we, there was a time in my life when you could only get seasonal fruits and vegetables in our stores. And you waited all year for the raspberries or for the corn because you knew you had to wait. And when they came, there was a narrow window and you really wanted to, it gave you a relish and a gusto and a, a joy that you had, you know, it was raspberry time, it was peach time, it was fresh corn time. Today you can go into any grocery store in a city in North Dakota, it's not so true in the villages, and get fresh corn, fresh raspberries, fresh cherries year around. And so we, again, it's the same story. Life is better now in almost every respect, but something is lost. It's, 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 um, there's a tension here, and that tension is worth looking at. And Steinbeck was looking at it in 1960. Well, now flash forward 50 years, it's 2010. And now, my, I mean, I, made my, I flew the first time in my life at the age of 16. I didn't then fly for five more years. My daughter has flown a hundred legs of flights and she's just 16. And that's her world, that's the world that has emerged. And so what Steinbeck was doing on this journey was taking a look at America and saying, hmm, here's what's happening and here's what it seems to signify. Here's the upside of it, here's the downside of it, here's the part I'm not sure about. And by the way, Larry, talking to the dog, processing this, <laughs> as you would too on a long journey with a dog, and then writing about it at Maple River. I mean, the main chapter on this sociological examination of the changing face of America is, is written in, seemingly yeah. in North Dakota. He probably wrote it a year later when he was back in New York, but he sets it in Blandsville, North Dakota. All right. I'd like to take just a second and read the paragraph sure. okay. uh, at, at this point, because I was really impressed, because you and I have had this ongoing dialogue about whether things are really better and what we've lost. Because you're, and, you're like a total futurist. Oh yeah, we've never had it so good. You have no sense of nostalgia or loss, do you? Not much. Yeah. <laughs> and you do. Yeah, because I think Well, that, you know that... Uh, oh, go ahead and no, interrupt. No, go, yeah, go ahead. No, please. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, please. Okay. <laughs> No, please. We may have different temperaments, I dare say we do, but I, I love what's happening. This is, I mean, if Harold Macmillan, the, the former Prime Minister of England were here, he would say to North Dakota, you've never had it so good. We're, we're wealthier, 
we're more mobile, we're better wired, we're more comfortable, we're, we live longer, we have a better access to every fruit of life. This is, the, without question, the best time in the history of North Dakota, bar none, and it's going to get better. And there's no reason to, to, to cast any, sh any cloud on that of, of any sort. But there is loss. For one thing, let me give you a very palpable loss. The, the population of North Dakota has gone up by a, a few thousand people during this decade, and it'll go up quite a bit more now. But the, there are 40 plus counties in North Dakota that between 2000 and 2009 lost population in double digits. So while Bismarck is growing like crazy, not necessarily entirely for the good, and while Fargo is blossoming, and Minot and Grand Forks, and to a certain degree now Dickinson and Williston, the rural places like Grassy Butte and Crosby and Ambrose and Mott and Hedinger and Bowman and so on, the hemorrhaging is extraordinary. I mean, th these are places where the population was already down to a bare minimum. And in the last nine years, they've lost double-digit population. So we're, going to, we're moving from a state where we have a lively village culture to a state that has city-states, and Bowman might be a regional little place, and Rugby might be another regional place, and Carrington another, but we're, we're living through a rural collapse that is made possible by the very things that we love so much. That's one thing. The, the, the culture of canning, of gardening, of quilting, of neighboring, of that whole world, that, you know, that world, is heavily eroded by the pace of our lives and by the connectivities of our lives. So this is not 100% joy just because it's the best time in North Dakota history. And I think it's worth feeling some of that ambivalence, don't you? No. You don't. I mean, well, I think you've got a very romantic view of, of what is being lost. You know, that, I, I remember when you went up to someplace up north there and you, you came back just invigorated because you had been throwing bundles into a thrashing machine or something yeah. and talking about how much we lost. How would you like to do that every year? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a... Well, no, you're just trivializing it. You know, the Mott is dying. I'm not talking about a guy on a, on a, on a threshing machine. Mott is dying because these small villages and the culture that they have sustained which is a really interesting culture. That is eroding enormously in our time. And that's not, that's not necessarily romantic, that's just a fact of rural collapse. Well, I think the negative words here, collapse and loss, and I mean, things are changing. And that doesn't necessarily, I mean, anytime things change, there's something that's gonna be left behind or it's gonna be changed or whatever. And I just don't know if the term collapse is a, is a good term. We're, we're still gonna be North Dakota, we're still North Dakota. Uh, we're just a different North Dakota. We're different North Dakota today than the North Dakota you and I grew up in and the, the North Dakota our parents grew up in was different. Let's just, so let's just, just test different. this out, okay. Larry. But I wanna wait, read wait, what wait, Steinbach. Wait, 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 you, you can let's, here, back let's, let's just test this out. We oh, have this wonderful right. audience here. Okay. They're patiently listening to this drivel that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go to questions here in a minute. We but. do. But let me just minutes. ask, I mean, and I mean this in the very neutral way, how many of you feel that in spite of all the great things that are happening to North Dakota, that there is a palpable loss of something that we all greatly value in North Dakota life that comes with that? Now, there's a loaded question. Well, answer it. <laughs> ask it your way. Ask it. Well, let's ask see it, Look at there was a vast majority are with me. So, so now re reshape the question as you so like the, it. They're romantics. No, like but, but now ask it. Ask well, no, it. let's read what, let's, let's hear what Steinbeck had to say about it. Having this. been overwhelmed by the audience. I've been overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, good. But this is, now Steinbeck is reflecting on this homogenized American life. Right. Okay. Even while I protest the assembly line production of our food, our songs, our language, and eventually our souls, I know that it was a rare home that baked good bread in the old days. Mother's cooking was, with rare exceptions, poor. That good, unpasteurized milk touched only by flies and bits of manure crawled with bacteria. The healthy old-time life was riddled with aches, sudden death from unknown causes, 
and that sweet local speech I mourn was the child of illiteracy and ignorance. It is the nature of a man as he grows older, a small bridge in time, to protest against change, particularly change for the better. But it is true that we have exchanged corpulence for starvation, and either one will kill us. The lines of change are down. We, or at least I, can have no con conception of human life and human thought in a hundred years or fifty years. Perhaps my greatest wisdom is the knowledge that I do not know. The sad ones are those who waste their energy in trying to hold it back, <laughs> for they can only feel bitterness in loss and no joy in gain. Thank you very much. <laughs> now let's vote. I just have, I have two things to say to this, Larry. One is, how scogan of you to, to go in and find the most the grimly negative assessment of rural life that you could so that you can hold up this glittering future that we're in. I mean, this is a long and interesting book, and you've just, you've just squeezed out the scogan paragraph from it. So congratulations. Thank you. And secondly, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how yin and yang we are. I mean, it's, I don't dismiss you as a hopeless, what would I say, futurist. I don't, I, don't, I don't abuse you because you are naively attached to the industrial paradigm. But you make it seem as if I'm some sort of pathetic jode in my jalopy longing for a time when there was manure in our milk. I mean, come on, Larry. Fight fair, for goodness sakes. Shall we go on? Well, I think we're done here. I mean, <laughs> let's, what else is there? No, we, well, here's the, okay, now, this is, right. of course, the most famous image yep. of, the, of the Depression. Uh, it has nothing to do with the book, but it's just such a magnificent image. And this is, the, of course, this will only reinforce your view that good riddance to that world. But, um, but here's, I'm not going to do this gag about you, this one. Um, <laughs> but Steinbeck wrote a series of articles for the San Francisco News. They became the basis for the novel. He went out, he actually did, the, he did his work. He went out into the camps. He went out into the squatters' camps. He was involved in 1936 in a big flood at Visalia, and that actually creates the depth of the second half of the novel. He, uh, he went out, he, didn't, he never traveled Route 66. He, it became a kind of legendary that he had, that he'd gone to Chicago and, and gotten with a family of some sort and, and driven the whole trail. He never did. And he did little parts of it, from Needles uh, through the Tehachapi Pass and into San Bernardino, but he never did the full Route 66. But he did go out and sort of see that world, and he interviewed uh, people in the camps. He worked with them, helping to build shanties and so on. And so it was on the basis of that that he got the realism of those chunks of the novel. Uh, let's go on from this. This is the... I, had the, I did a cultural tour a year and a half ago with David Borlaug, and we went to Jefferson's, Virginia, and we went to the University of Virginia uh, library, and they have the manuscript of the Grapes of Wrath there. It's one of the great rare books libraries in the country, and this is it. Steinbeck wrote in longhand with pencil in a ledger book. Uh, Pablo Covici sent him these ledger books that are you know, 11 by 18, and he wrote it all in there, and this is the ledger book. You can see it right here. That's what it looks like. And what I, what I like about this so much, Larry, is look at the top. The, he squeezed in some extra language on the top there. You can see it up there. Above the line, you know, he's trying very hard to stay in this ledger book, so he's added some of it here. It's a, he wrote it in 100 days, which is just astonishing, one of the great novels written in a third of a year. And almost no... He, almost, he crossed off very little in the course of it. It's a very, very clean text from which his first wife typed it. That's that stuff up in the corner. Here's another section of it. But here is the end of it. This is the end of the novel. This is the Rosa Sharon paragraph. I'll just read that paragraph um, while we're here. This is the famous paragraph that caused so much trouble. But you can see it here. And then he wrote the end at the, you know, at the bottom with great relief, this was October 26th, 1938. For a minute, Rose of Sharon sat still in the whispering barn. Then she hoisted her tired body up and drew the comforter about her. She moved slowly to the corner and stood looking down at the wasted face into the wide, frightened eyes. Then slowly she lay down beside him. He shook his head slowly from side to side. 
Rose of Sharon loosened one side of the blanket and bared her breast. You got to, she said. She squirmed closer and pulled his head close. There, she said, there. Her hand moved behind his head and supported it. Her fingers moved gently in his hair. This is the famous line that ends the novel. She looked up and across the barn, and her lips came together and smiled mysteriously. And this is that. It's just so, I mean, for me, it's just thrilling to actually look at the manuscript, uncorrected, where he wrote this piece to, to close one of the great American novels. And you go to the University of Virginia, they'll pull it out and let you with gloves look at it. That paragraph is full of symbolism. Yes. What is it to you? Well, a couple of things are going on. One, there's a pieta there. There's the mother Mary with the Christ child. You know, there, there's a pieta with the, with the crucified Christ. The man is sort of a Christ symbol. There are lots of Christ symbols in this book. It's also, it's part of his theory. When the Jodes begin their journey from eastern Oklahoma, they're individualists, and Tom Jode has been in prison for a manslaughter. He gets out of prison, and now he is a, rash, a radical individualist. And in the course of the journey from Oklahoma through New Mexico and Arizona and finally into California, the family is changed from a group of individuals into a, a phalanx or a family. And they then come to California as a unified family. But even as a family, they can't survive there. And so then they become a community, and that's the passage I read before. They become a community of people helping each other. Here's a blanket, here's some meat, we'll share this, we'll help you with a tire. And so they move from radical individualism to family, from family to community, and then it ends with this kind of universal family of man where she's now offering her breast to a complete stranger because they have transcended ego and transcended selfishness and transcended... Uh, their own family unit, even their community unit, and now she's part of the world soul of the healing process. And so that's been the, the underlying plot of this book. And that's why he insisted on this paragraph, even though it uh, really upset his publisher because he knew the kind of re response they would get. But the idea of, of sharing your breast with a, socialism. With a complete s socialism. This is socialism, then. How so? Everything you just explained. Was, I mean, isn't that why he's accused of being a socialist? Well, I mean, no. If, if, if you and I are traveling through the American West and you break down and I offer you my tire, that's not socialism, that's Christian generosity. Well, but the way you explain how the family came together, they came together as a, an organic family with all the other people that were... And they shared, but there wasn't a government right. redistributing anything or, or directing this. The socialism comes from the New Deal, which created the government camps. There were two types of camps in California. There were squatters camps, and I'll show you one. And then there were these government camps, a handful of them. Weed Patch was one of them, and it was down by Bakersfield. And they were run by the New Deal, and they were exemplary. They had, the, 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 the shanty camps were just horrible. They were filthy, no latrines, no running water, uh, no zoning, no streets, nothing. And then these camps that were set up by the New Deal had washing machines, and toilets. Most of these Okies had never had anything but outhouses, and suddenly they are living in a camp that has toilets. And Tom Collins, the, the, who had led the, the, the Weed Patch Camp, actually ran a kind of anarchy and allowed the, the, the migrant families to participate in self-government, and they formed committees and so on. So I, I would not regard what the Jodes were doing as socialists, but, but the New Deal had certainly had socialist leanings to it. Well, this is the last line of... Uh, of the Grapes of Wrath, but here's, here's the Dust Bowl, Larry. There's Route 66, it runs from Chicago to, um, to the coast. These are pictures, these are actual New Deal pictures now. These are not from the film. These are pictures of, of the actual migration. And remember, we regard these as Okies. They could just as well be called Nodaks. We lost more people during this period. My uncle, for example, in, in D Detroit Lakes, hopped a freight and went to Tacoma and worked in the berry fields during this time. Families were broken up. My maternal grandfather had seven brothers and sisters. Only two of them stayed in Minnesota. All six of the others went to California and they all prospered during this period. Uh, here's a squatter's camp. Look at, there's a, there's a true squatter's camp. Look at the squalor. This is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people living like this 
squatting on the land uh, near a, a, a giant industrial orange ranch or pistachio ranch or lettuce ranch. Here's one of the shacks. Uh, you, you can't caricature when you watch The Grapes of Wrath, the film. This is exactly what these vehicles looked like. These are, these are historic pictures from the Depression. Here's a family loaded up with all of its goods. They're kind of haunting, aren't they? Mm -hmm. what this is, is the, the Dust Bowl. Look at this. I mean, some of you can remember the dust blowing in North Dakota. Um, I, my mother-in-law in Kansas could remember when the dust blew so hard that she had to put wet towels on all the window sills and doors because it would, the dust would pile up two, three inches deep overnight. Sorry. No, I, what, what is the social impact of The Grapes of Wrath? Admittedly, a great novel, great American writer, all that sort of stuff. What's the social impact of it? Well, today, I mean, we live in a time of enormous prosperity. I'm sure there is suffering even in North Dakota, but not much. We don't remember this, frankly. My grandparents remembered it, and my father to a certain degree, but I, I live in a generation that doesn't remember it, and my daughter certainly doesn't remember it. But when you read this book, like other great books, it puts you, it gives you a lens into a world that's not yours. And when people read this, you can't read this book with a generous spirit and not be haunted by this, that, I mean, not only did this happen, that hundreds of thousands of people in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, etc., were displaced through no fault of their own by climatic conditions, by the rapid industrialization of agriculture, and by the Great Depression. And they, in sheer desperation, they decided they would go to Canaan, to the land of plenty in California, where they had been told by the growers there were jobs. The flyers were traveling, you know, these, these little brochures and flyers were going throughout the, the Great Plains saying, plenty of work in California. And so people from here, from places like Grassy Butte and, and Grand Forks and, and uh, Jamestown, left everything and went out to, these, to California, hoping that they would find a better life. And when they got there, two things happened. There were too many of them for the number of jobs available. And the growers, instead of feeling compassion towards this exodus, regarded it as a threat to be exploited but to be feared. And so the, here's, what, here's what upset Steinbeck. These growers would have oranges that they couldn't sell. But rather than give them to the starving, I mean, I'm not just saying hungry, but the starving migrants, they would burn them or pour lye on them or pour gasoline on them. They wouldn't share what they couldn't sell. They destroyed it first, and they would take piglets and slaughter them and then pour chemicals on them so that the migrants couldn't have them. And so here are migrants that are literally having their babies starve at their breasts, and there's food aplenty in California, and the growers would not share it because they felt threatened by this, this inrush of migrants. And so that's what got Steinbeck going. He said, that's why we use the grapes of wrath, that the, there's building up this vintage of wrath, and it's going to be visited upon those who have and don't share. And so I think that anyone who reads this becomes aware that America has not always been this place, uh, and that there is always a, a group of people who suffer in this country, no matter how prosperous we become, and that wealth, not always, but often, and you'll see, you're going to see this in the oil patch in North Dakota, where you have sudden millionaires in every direction, wealth does not always bring out the best qualities of the human spirit in people. And so all those themes are eternal themes that go back to Genesis or Exodus or Arthur, and Steinbeck found an imperishable way to embody them in a great piece of art about one of the great moments in American history. And if you read it today, if you can read this novel today and not be upset by it in some really fundamental ways, then I'd be surprised because it is that great a piece of art. So that's what I would say. Look at this. I mean, this, people from North Dakota will remember this. This is Tom Collins, the, the man who was the hero of the book. Uh, in the camp at Weed Patch, there he is. Here, here's Steinbeck's description of him, of a little man in a damp, frayed white suit. He had a small mustache. His graying black hair stood up on his head like the quills of a frightened porcupine. But here's the great line. In his large, dark eyes, tired beyond sleepiness, 
the kind of tired that won't let you sleep even if you have, sorry, a typo, have time in a bed. Here he is again, helping people at the, the weed patch camp near Bakersfield. You can go see that camp even today. Here's the flood that so upset Steinbeck, the in Visalia in the Central Valley. This flood occurred in 1936, and he was out there helping families try to move out of these shanties and shacks to higher ground, and there wasn't really any higher ground. Then he became this persona non grata and so on. Well, just to wrap it up, this is what Monterey looks like today. The man who was regarded as public enemy number one is now a source of great tourist wealth for mm -hmm. Monterey and Carmel. Uh, just a thought to share with you, and you, you can disagree with this. Really? Um, well, I was thinking, uh, the reason I asked the question about what the social impact is, it, it's a wonderful book. I just don't know if it had a social impact, and I think it was probably a timing issue. You know, I think of Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's, which, not that, it's not that kind of book. Right. Or The Jungle, Upton Sinclair's Jungle, and, and as a result of that, we end up with the Food and Drug Act. And, you know, they had, they had real social implications, those two books. And, and this, published in 39, just months before... Hitler invades Poland, and I, I guess I think that if it had not, if it had been published a couple years earlier, it might have had a, a more of a social impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, very few books have a social impact. Very few books change the world. This this one is not one of them. This can change minds, but it didn't change policy, if that's what you yeah, mean. Yeah. And the World War II just suddenly happened, and when that happened, we became prosperous again, and California went to full employment and beyond, and you know, we've never really looked back as a nation. But, but North Dakota suffered in the 1980s grievously, it had a kind of a mini Dust Bowl depression, and I've been reading a lot about this in George Sinner's memoir. It was a very desperate time in North Dakota. And those of you who were here then remember that the out-migration was such that we were afraid we, I mean, there was some concern that North Dakota would, would radically depopulate during this period and that the economy was, was so severely impacted by drought and remember the credit crisis, mm -hmm. the Carter-Reagan credit crisis and so on, that there were suicides, there were suicide hotlines all over the state. That's when Willie Nelson did his first Farm Aid concert. To, uh, that's when the Posse Comitatus was big in North Dakota and, and um, Gordon Call, the radical... I mean, radical movements uh, were created here because of the, the severity of the conditions, and they were much deeper in the 30s than they were in the 1980s. So did it, did it have an effect? Well, Eleanor Roosevelt praised it. I mean, it was universally denounced by the capitalists, but Eleanor Roosevelt said she'd been out to the camps and to the squatters' um, spots, and she said that Steinbeck, if anything, underplayed the, the, the tragedy that was occurring. So I don't know that you could say that it changed American policy, but I think it changed American thinking. And, and, and I'm glad that it exists, because I want my daughter, every year, my daughter's now 16, every year I say, you, she loves of mice and men, which is a very great piece of work. But I keep saying to her, you have to read The Grapes of Wrath, because The Grapes of Wrath will shape the way you see life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what great books can do. Um, we're going to go to ask if there are any questions, but you... Uh, mentioned Bill and Jean Guy. Oh, and let's you didn't go get back. back to yeah. it. This yeah. is one of my, you want to end on a light note. So I can you, want tell, to do, yeah. you want to do that. And then um, we have, should have a microphone someplace. Is Robin? The, okay. I, and, and I would ask if you have a question, um, wait till you get the microphone because this is being taped. And if you don't get the microphone, then it doesn't get picked up. So let me tell you the story you. about this, Larry, as we, as people get sort of raise their hand. But, uh, what happened was that I did, we, you know, David Borlaug and I did this uh, documentary on Bill and Jean Guy, and I had many chances to interview them in Fargo and, and elsewhere, and she told this wonderful story about when she and Bill Guy in April of 1963 went to the Kennedy White House. They were invited to a state dinner at the Kennedy White House, and they um, had to buy clothes for this, and they went off to Washington, and they took a common taxi cab over to the White House, and so they are like, the, the way they tell it is they're a couple of rubes from North Dakota. Of course, that's not true. They were even then very sophisticated people, but they go to the White House and they're, they're admitted in and they go up to the usher and he's wearing a white tuxedo, she's wearing a gown that's now in, uh, in a museum in NDSU. 
And they go up to the usher and, and say, we're Bill and Jean Guy, Governor and First Lady of North Dakota. And the usher hands them their envelope. And, and Bill Guy is seated at table eight. And Jean Guy is seated at table one. So she's going to be with the President of the United States. And she says to the usher, oh, there must be some mistake. He's the governor, and I'm just his wife. Um, I, you, you got this wrong. And the usher said, and I quote her, Madam, we do not make mistakes. <laughs> so then she went up to table one, and Bill went, Governor Guy went to table eight, and she sat next to Douglas Dillon, the Secretary of the Treasury, and on the other side of Douglas Dillon was JFK. So she's one away from JFK next to Douglas Dillon, a new frontiersman. And then I'm, I'm interviewing her in the studio in Fargo, and I said, well, who was on the other side? And she said, oh, John Steinbeck. So she's sitting between Douglas Dillon and John Steinbeck. He's just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and then there's JFK. This is six months before the assassination. And so we're having this interview, and I said, and I was thinking about Steinbeck, and I said, that must have been amazing. And she said, well, I didn't really like this Steinbeck. <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, well, I had read his book about that, the farmers. Great and I didn't like the book very much. And I said, okay, you know, it is one of the world's great books, but that's fine. <laughs> and, and she said, but he was, he turned out to be a really interesting man. And he, she said, apparently he had just, like, just come through North Dakota with a dog or something. <laughs> you know, she's doing all this on tape. It was fa fantastic. And so I said, yeah, that's Travels with Charlie. And I later sent her a copy of, after the interview. And then, but here's, here was how she said, he, she said, I really liked him at dinner. He said, he turned to her and he said, Madam, this is the, one of the best days of my life. And she said he was engaging and he was gracious and he was courtly. And then she said, and at the end of the dinner, I needed to get my purse, which I had put down on the ground next to my chair, and I was reaching for it, and he, he picked it up for me and he handed it to me, and he said, Madam, here is your reticule. <laughs> and she said, I had never heard the word reticule before. And so she she became a Steinbeck fan based upon having dinner with him in the White House. Not Isn't that bad. cool? Yeah. And who did Governor Guy sit so with? So then I'm, so here's, Bill, Bill Guy is sitting here <laughs> while she's, she's telling this story, and I'm, my eyes are getting bigger, and I'm just loving the story. And so she's telling the story and, and all these wonderful details, and then I turned to him and said, Governor, who were you sitting with? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great story. Okay, do we have any questions? We have, again, a microphone. There's a question right close by. I really have to know he left me hanging on that. When he got the answer, when he said no at the uh, press conference? Yes. Did he take the brandy with him? <laughs> yes, he took the brandy with him. Uh, Great. <laughs> and stomped out, right? Left, left in a huff. His feelings were hurt. Any so, other questions? Could be it. It could be it, huh? Well, I think we've we've exhausted them. The f I think they're so upset by the fight we had up here. <laughs> but Larry, I mean, you haven't read *The Grapes of Wrath* recently, but you remember reading it. I mean, yeah. it, it must have had oh, a significant impact on yeah. you. I, I, I agree. I, I think you can't read *The Grapes of Wrath* and not have a. No, I, I suppose it's a Steinbeck view of the Great Depression. But history tells us that most of what he said is true, and, and it, was, it, it was accurate. It was accurate. It yeah. was about it was politically America at that time. He had a point of view. Place. Yeah. He, had, he had a he had an obvious point of view. Well, let's, but let's see. Any let's questions? See. That's all right. They don't. They're just ready to go. <laughs> um, let me just read one last passage. This okay. Is from and East of Eden. Let's call that the end. This is from East of Eden, and this is this gets back to that sense that there. are his simplicity, the deep simplicity at the center of his art. He's talking about Kathy Ames, who's the, who is the bad person in this novel, a prostitute, a murderer, and so on. He says this. This is one of the famous passages from Steinbeck. I believe there are monsters born in the world to human parents. Some you can see, misshapen and horrible, with huge heads or tiny bodies. Some are born with no arms, no legs, some with three arms, some with tails or mouths in odd places. They are accidents and no one's fault, as used to be thought. 
once they were considered the visible punishments for concealed sin, so people with, with deformed births. Then he says, and just as there are physical monsters, can there not also be mental or psychic monsters born? The face and body may be perfect, but if a twisted gene or a malformed egg can produce physical monsters, may not the same process produce a malformed soul? Then he goes on to say, you know, you can tell a person with a shriveled arm because it's visible, but you can't tell a moral monster. In fact, you often find them beautiful in one or charismatic or interesting in some way, and that makes you vulnerable to their moral monstrosity. And so that's exactly the kind of work that Steinbeck does. And, and very sophisticated literary critics find this too simplistic or too moralistic or too um, heavy-handed, but that's the kind of author that he was. I mean, he does, in spite of the non-teleological teachings of Ed Ricketts, he sees the world sometimes in very moral terms. And the, the main character of this book is, a, is, a, is an evil woman. And he's saying, you know, today we'd be more likely to say we should look at what happened to her in her childhood because that probably distorted her natural development. Steinbeck would say, no. Once every X million times someone is born and they're evil and nothing made them that way, they just are. And so this is a novel about good and evil and it's based on the Cain and Abel story. That's a heavy way to end. Do you have a lighter story to end on? A lighter story? Oh, we have a question. Okay. Last, good, we get a we question. do have a question. So we'll end on a question here. It actually is a question about the character Kathy. We read that book in our book club, oh, and one of the members had found a quote-unquote fact that Kathy was based on one of Steinbeck's ex-wives. <laughs> is that true? If so, she'd have reason to be very upset. Um, <laughs> no, uh, the, but this is a semi-autobiographical novel. He actually wrote it for his sons, and it's about his own maternal grandparents and, his, and, and, his, and other kin of the Salinas Valley. And so a lot of it is based upon family history, but of course it's fictionalized, and, um, and, and in any fiction there are gonna be those leaps. But Kathy Ames, who is this prostitute and, and murderer and many, many other things, is not based on his second wife, Gwendolyn, but, but I, I'm a writer myself at, a, at an infinitely lower level of, of accomplishment. I can tell you that for a writer, when you want to write about an evil person or, or a, a proud person or you know, a failure, this or that, you, you write about something you're creating by way of what you know. And so he probably was full of unhappy energies about his second wife that then fueled this portrait of, of you know, a kind of profound caricature of what he found wrong with his second wife. His second wife did commit adultery and so I suppose you could say that there might be, some of that might have fueled Kathy Ames, but there's no, there's no immediate attempt to, to write about his wife by way of writing about this character. But, but all of our experiences, if you're a writer, all of your experiences inform that which you produce, and you can only write what you know. So you have to go to where in, where in my experience is the evil person, is the hero, is the wanderer, etc. And I'd like to end then on this note. Uh, first, if you haven't read Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie, I highly recommend it. I had not read it until we were getting ready for this. Clay said, you yeah, gotta read it, and I'm so glad I did, particularly when I found that one paragraph. Yeah, um, a Skogan paragraph. <laughs> but I really recommend it, and at the same time, at the cost of embarrassing Clay here, if you have not read Message on the Wind, you need to read it, that's by Clay. And I'm gonna tell you the truth, as I was reading this, it was reminding me of his book. Oh um, well, yeah, I did. And uh, so I recommend that you read both those. Read Clay's Message on the Wind and read Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie and you'll read two very good books. Well, so. you know, Larry, that's a nice thing for you to say and I, I'd be happy if people read my books, but they are like comic books compared to literature. Oh, come on. No, truly. Truly, and so they, this is not the same equation by any means. I was having a good time. <laughs> I recommend the books if you haven't read them. 
Thank you very much for coming today. And on the 9th of January, we're going to talk about Custer. George Custer.